name's Carol Reese. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a master gardener. I'm here with uh, the Rutherford County Master Gardeners. It's a magnificent organization. If you ever want to be a master gardener, they accept, start accepting applications for the next year in October. Usually they only take 20 to 30 applications per year. It's a huge commitment. If you're not of a mind to do the Master Gardener program, we also have the Garden Basics program, which uh, is uh, similar education, not as in-depth, and you don't have to do volunteer work. We are volunteers. I'm here with two of my fellow Master Gardeners, Tree Supply and Jack Smith. Today we're going to talk about Tennessee Smart Yards. This is a program uh, primarily for homeowners in the Tennessee area that was put together by the state of Tennessee and the Extension Service in the state of Tennessee. Extension Service in Tennessee is, um, you can find it on the internet, uh, anything that ends in .edu is extension, Any, and that's each state in the country. Uh, the uh, um, Extension Service was established in the late 1880s as a vehicle to provide educations from uh, land-grant universities in each state. Typically, there's two universities in each state that are considered land-grant universities. All the research in those universities pertaining to agriculture was established, was, was meant to be a direct conduit to the people that it served primarily farmers. To, so the research that they did was meant to be distributed to farmers right away. This wasn't drug research, this was agriculture research. So that's where we got Extension. Extension was overwhelmed about 30 years ago and a guy out west established the Master Gardener program and that's where we came from. So Tennessee Smart Yards was established by this very same organization, uh, Tennessee um, Extension, to give you some idea of how to have a smart yard, which is a yard that doesn't that that you can maintain easily, that's good for wildlife and the environment, and not expensive to maintain, and, and just a, a smarter way to go about maintaining your yard. Um, there is a publication that I neglected to give to Kathy Herod in time, so that she would be able to copy it for you. Um, it's on the website. It's this right here. What it is, uh, goes over, it's a, it's a way to rate yourself, gives you a rating power, and you assign points for each thing that you do well in your yard. So if you're maintaining your water, the water that comes off your roof, um, if you have a, a little garden, a, a rain garden or a swale, or you have water barrels collecting your water and it doesn't just rush off your lawn into the gutters. Uh, if you don't put oil in the uh, water, rainwater system, if you don't dump stuff down in your um, pothole, not your potholes, but your sinkholes, because that all ends up in your rivers, um, you get points. And if you get to 36 points, which is a yardstick, and that's the way they do it, you can apply to the state of Tennessee and I think you have to pay, but you get a little sign that says Tennessee Smart Yard. If you live in a subdivision, it's a big deal. And we're just going to go over the highlights of that and give you some idea of how to, uh, to apply for and obtain the designation and the little sign that says, I've got a Tennessee Smart Yard. For, it's a great virtue signal. It's a great virtue signal. Here it is. A certified Tennessee Smart Yard. A yard that is in balance with the local environment for the benefit of both people and our ecosystem. Uh, it emphasizes stewardship. Principles of stewardship serve as the foundation for the program and are explored in online modules and practical workshops taught by UT, TSU, Extension, and water resource professionals. They emphasize water quite a bit. Not water. It, water is in what's coming off your roof and water is in what's running through your yard. Number one tenant of the Tennessee Smart Yard program is right plant, right place. That means I'm not gonna plant a, put a plant in my area that I know can't make it, that will, um, I'm not gonna put a tree that's 50 foot tall at maturity in a space designed to hold a 10 foot tree. I'm not, I'm only gonna plant what I can easily maintain. Uh, and it emphasized native plants, but 
Uh, so you have to plan in site evaluation around your yard. When you take landscaping uh, classes, like at, at my level, at lower, lower level, um, they tell you to write down, you, you look at your yard and you draw a diagram and you look at each section of your yard and you establish what you would like to have there. What do you want? Do you want shade? Do you want a, a spa? Do you want a swimming pool? Do you want a lazy river? Um, you establish what you want and then you start writing down what's, you write it all down and then you start marking off what is not possible. Do you want a wildlife ha habitat? Um, do you want compost bins? Do you want a parking area? Do you want a tennis court? All those things. And, and that's the beginning. Careful planning and site evaluation. Do you want a sprinkler system? Um, do you want microclimates? That's any climate that will uh, allow a plant that would not normally grow there to grow there. Uh, crepe myrtles are not necessarily, they're adversely affected by the cold that we get in the winter time, but in a little microclimate where they don't get exposed to drying winds and freezing cold, like a little cubby in, uh, next to your house, they'll do fine. Camellias the same way. Um, camellias are not, we are a little north for a camellia, um, but if you have a little microclimate, you got it. Or an area where you acidify the soil to the point where your azaleas or your, June or your um, rhododendrons or your camellias or your blueberries can grow. You, you acidify all that soil. That's a, that's a microclimate is to a change the elements of that spot. So something that would not normally grow there can grow there. Um, drainage. Some plants like it dry. Some plants like it wet. You just make sure you plant the plant that's going to be exposed to what it likes. Um, I think eastern red cedars grow everywhere. Um, Rosa Sharon likes it wet. Cattails like it wet. Witch hazel likes it a, li a little bit wet. Other plants like it dry and desert-like, uh, such as you'll be exposed to in a cedar glade. So just, just plan. Soil types. Some plants like loose soil. Some plants like clay. There's a lot of nutrients in clay. No matter what you hear people complaining about, there are tons of nutrients in clay. The trick is to get them out. Um, garden type, fruit. Do you, want a, do you want a vegetable garden? It's just landscape design. Now, manage your soils and your mulches. First thing, and you're going to be so tired of me hearing, or saying this, soil test. For $20, you can take your soil, go around your yard, go around your space, wherever you're going to plant. You dig up, take the organic matter off the top of the soil, and then you dig down four to six inches, put it in a bucket, carry it to the ag center, give them 20 bucks. They send it off to UTTSU. You tell them on your sheet that you fill out what you intend to plant, if anything. They send you information on whether that's uh, possible or not and give you recommendations for what to plant if you don't put anything. But that's at the ag office at John, on John Rice Boulevard. Um, consider how you can improve your soil. Improving soil really comes down to mulch, organic material, organic material, organic material. I know you've heard me say it before, I'll say it again. If you have clay and you add, add sand, that's how they make concrete. And that's what you'll end up with. Um, build a rain garden, soak up rainwater, and slowly release it to replenish ground and surface water sources. I don't have a really good picture of a rain garden on here, but there is a rain garden out at the Ag Center that you pass when you go to the farmer's market that's on Tuesdays and Fridays that is unbelievable. The people that work that garden have done an incredible job. And that absorbs all the water that comes off that parking lot before it hits that pond and sucks all of the oils and the pollutants and the gasoline and the trash and it lets that water sit and percolate down into the ground, which is magnificent. Really, highly recommend that garden. Please go see it. it it's drop dead gorgeous. Uh, provides nutrients, air and water to the plants. Um, and traps contaminants. This is a this is a zero scape garden. This is anytime you see these yuccas, you know you're you're looking at zero scape. I can't tell what the other stuff is. Looks like some Mexican heather, maybe um, some grasses. 
That, that's, that's, a, that's a zero escape garden, one that gets very little water. Reduce, reuse, recycle, using salvage materials in your landscape. Those are trees um, that were cut, or branches that were cut, and uh, just you drive posts in the ground and then you just weave them while they're still pliable. Now you can grow, you can, if you have a weeping willow or a curly willow or just any old willow, you can make a living fence by cutting your branches off of your trees and putting them in the ground diagonally like this, then going back in and putting them in diagonally like this. And if that willow is fresh cut, they will continue to grow. You will have a living fence, which is so cool. Um, so, I mean, it's possible. Uh, use newspaper or cardboard to control weeds in the garden. Usually six to eight layers of newspaper, if you can find newspaper. We don't have newspapers anymore. You can't do it with your computer. Um, <laughs> but there is a lot of cardboard out there. I would hesitate when you use cardboard. It will break down, but corrugated cardboard has those little, tube, those little round tubes in it. And if you've noticed, things like ants love to make their houses in anything that's got little round tubes in it. So every time I use corrugated cardboard, I try to do it away from the house because um, I've had my uh, wiring to my, to my air handling system cut by ants because they like it and they get in there and they chew on the wires. Um, so yeah, I, enjoy. Um, <laughs> reusing branch debris to make a fence or a border. Uh, anything, you, you can use branches. My husband did that once. He took and he just put branches up and then wired them in to, to make a barrier. It's just a way to get rid of yard debris. And old shoes or buckets as planters. A lot of people do this. They take old stuff from the yard and they fill it full of dirt and they put plants in it. Um, great, if that's what you like. Me personally, not so much. But if that's what you like, you go right ahead. <laughs> Water efficiency, efficiently. Most plants need an inch of water a week. Um, it helps if it's, if you have mulch, it will percolate down through the soil. If it just runs off because the soil is so hard, then that's not as good. But um, water efficiently, design your yard so that it thrives on available rainfall. That's tough to do here. We go months without any rain and then we get a couple weeks of rain. So um, classify low, medium, and high water usage zones, select plants accordingly. Put all your plants that need a lot of water here, put plants that need a medium amount of water here, put plants that need a low amount of water here. Uh, high, uh, hot plants that need a lot of water, put them in a, a rain garden environment. Again, by all means, check out that rain garden at the Ag Center. Uh, and if you want, if you go on a Tuesday or a Thursday, a lot of times there's people working in it and they will tell you what's growing. If you want, I'll try to get a list of the plants that's in that garden for you. Um, plants will indicate when water is needed. Exception is your new annuals. A new annuals need a good bit of water probably every day. One inch of water each week. Use fertilizer appropriately. The first number is your nitrogen, the second number is your uh, phosphor phosphates, phosphorus, your, or phosphorus. Your third number is your uh, potassium. So that's NPK. Those are ma macronutrients. There's also such a thing as micronutrients, which are necessary for growth, but not as much as the macronutrients. Most trees and shrubs need little or no fertilizer once established. Uh, the exception to that would be your acid-loving shrubs because the soil will change, composition will change over time, especially if you need, live in an area with a lot of calcium, a lot of limestone sticking out of the soil. So you'll have to re-acidify the soil. If, you're, if your pH is outside the range, what a plant wants, it won't absorb any nutrients. It's got to be, usually it's in the six to seven range or five, five to seven range. P a pH of five, five to, uh, to seven is the normal range. But acid-loving plants like 
acid and they and once you treat them with an acid fertilizer later on it will revert back to a non-acid environment so just because our soil in here in this area is not acid um, nitrogen is for green leafy growth phosphorus is for root and bud growth potassium is for disease tolerance and drought tolerance you can get any combination you can get a, a 3200 if you just want nitrogen. You can get a 0, 10, 0 if you just want phosphorus. Um, that is uh, a number. If this was a 100 pound bag, 32 pounds of this bag would be nitrogen. 10 pounds of this bag would be phosphorus, and 10 pounds of this bag would be potassium. Um, and then the rest would be inert ingredients, nothing. Uh, just something that you're pouring on the ground. It's just a way to get the right number. Um, fertilizer labels represent the percent by weight of each of these nu nutrients. So if it's a 50 pound bag, um, it's only 16 pounds of nitrogen um, and uh, five pounds and five pounds respectively of your uh, phosphorus and potassium. Composting. Organic material is broken down in the presence of water and oxygen. Decomposing material reaches temperatures of up to 140 degrees, killing most weed <coughs> seeds. Or, uh, compost organics are the greens and the browns, 20 to 5, 50% green, 50 to 75% brown. Um, compost organics are the greens and the browns, 20 to 5, 50% should be green, 50 to 75% should be brown. Rain barrels range from a hundred to three hundred dollars there are some free classes in the city and in the county if you're of a mind and the master gardeners if you check their website they have do you know if any if those classes are full there were two classes no, no. okay the master gardeners got a grant to do rain barrels including the barrel for the public not for us i was a little perturbed but um so it's for y'all and if you'll contact them they may be able to uh, provide you with a class. There's also an agency in town. Oh, I forget the name of it that, that, does, rain, that does rain barrels. Um, range in size from 50 to 100 gallons, designed to keep mosquitoes out, connect to gutter downspout, and must be placed on a level base. Um, if you take the, the, the space of your roof, and the square footage, that's how much water, if you get an inch of water, that's how much water is coming off your roof. That's a lot. Even for a little house, that's a lot. Soil test. I know you're tired of hearing me say it. Uh, for grasses, it depends on the species in the season. Fescue is, is fertilized in the fall. Bermuda and warm season grasses are fertilized in, in the fall also. Um, two different kinds of grass. Bermuda or tall fescues and short fescues, what we normally plant around here. Tall fescues for the sun, short fescues, or the red fescues for the uh, shade. Uh, we, p we fertilize in the fall, but if you fertilize and it's not incorporated into the soil and you get a heavy rain, it'll wash your fertilizer away. So that ends up in your uh, wa water system. It, subsequently, it ends up in your lakes and streams and causes, in Virginia, where I originally took classes, they attributed homeowner for over fertilization that ended up in the uh, Chesapeake Bay for killing the oyster population because the phosphates promoted the growth of so much grass type vegetation in the water that, and then uh, it died, all it, it dies periodically, that it smothered the oyster larvae that were in the water. So it's ki it killed an industry. That we just, we just want to maintain as naturally as we can the balance of things. And it will adversely affect your waterways to have a lot of fertilizer in them. And grasses, or um, mud too. Not just uh, fertilizer, but um, mud you see them now where they put the little plastic things when they do construction, they put the little plastic fences. That's to stop the mud from running down into your waterways because it, it smothers 
the ant, the critters that would live in the stream bed. And, and so you're adversely affecting the food that they would eat. So I smothered this critter, the, the, one, the ne next critter's looking for them to eat, and there, there are none. So. Check your integrated pest management is introducing another pest to eat the first pest. So if I have integrated pest management and I have a ton of mosquitoes, then I m plant plants and provide a, a habitat for dragonflies because they'll eat my mosquitoes. When I, and this is a personal anecdote, not uh, necessarily a UTTSU thing. When I lived in Virginia, I lived behind a pond. And there were, uh, I, the, the pond had vegetation growing around it, so there was habitat for mosquitoes. But there was tons of dragonflies. I never had problems with mosquitoes. But my neighbors that lived one street over and weren't living on a pond did. Because my dragonflies were eating all the mosquitoes, and their mosquitoes were hiding under the leaves and coming out at night and getting them. That's integrated pest management. I'm going to send another pest to eat that pest rather than spraying with an insecticide. According to this Tennessee Yard uh, Smart Yard, check your lawn regularly. Uh, don't kill all your bugs. Good bugs eat bad bugs. Try at the least destructive destructive method of insect control first. Like I said, the, the ants that ate my wiring, I don't spray the whole house for ants. I just spray where my wiring is. <laughs> and, and it's a relatively innocuous um, insecticide. But you can use uh, insecticidal soaps, horticulture oils, and biological products. They all have drawbacks, be careful. Uh, insecticidal soaps work great. Horticultural oils, if you plant them in the sun during the heat of the year, it can uh, burn your plant leaves. Uh, biologic products, uh, they're very effective. Good luck. That's your Bacillus thuringiensis, the one that kills the grubs in the soil so you have less moles. That type of thing, the biologic agents. That's not all of them, just the type of thing. Um, spot treat. Be tolerant of low levels of pests. I don't ever try to kill everything. And read the label. It's against federal law to use any herbicide or insecticide out, uh, outside the confines of what's on that label. Uh, be, for that reason, read the label. Uh, just, you won't kill it any more dead if you put 10 times as much insecticide in your bottle. Good bugs. These are your good bugs. The thing that actually eats the most aphids and bugs on your plants is not the ladybug. It's that larva right there. That's the larval form of the ladybug. And they eat a ton of bugs. So when you see that ugly little thing, don't kill it. Uh, good bugs are your ladybugs and your ladybug larva. Your assassin bug. Green lacewing larva. Green lacewing, big-eyed bug, praying mantis, surfed fly, and surfed fly larva. Um, praying mantises, I'm sure you're familiar, they're fantastic. But your ladybug's even better. <laughs> Control your storm water. Where does the water go? One inch of rain on a 200 square foot house produces 1,250 Whoa. gallons of storm water that's going somewhere. Uh, flows across hard surfaces and picks up pollutants and other stuff and carries it into the waterways. Um, have you ever noticed why your, where your mulch goes? Have you ever noticed that if you're using an organic mulch at the end of the season, it's, a lot of times it's gone? Well, organic mulches are lightweight. So when you get a heavy rain, have you ever see, you see what your yard looks like after a heavy rain. Mm -hmm. All the lightweight stuff that came down out of the other areas is laying out in the middle of nowhere. So, so your organic material, unless you get specifically heavy stuff, like instead of getting the pine, uh, the little bitty shredded pine, you get the big nuggets. Uh, a lot of people put those around in the trees because it takes much longer to break down and plus it's harder uh, to flow away. Um, but, so watch what you put in because when it flows across your hard surfaces, it'll pick up and carry pollutants and your mulches into the waterways. 
Flowing across absorbent surfaces recharges your groundwater and waters the plants in the vicinity. So if it's absorbent, that water is going into the soil, not down into the ditch. You just got to slow it down a little bit. Uh, storm water runoff and pollutants. Observe the flow of water on your property. Is it flowing, picking up fertilizers, pesticides, and oils and disturbed soils? If so, the pollutants will end up in your waterways. Pollutants in the waterways affect the life of the streams, smothers the life of fish gills, reducing oxygen levels, and destroying habitat. Can also cause flooding by silt blocking channels. That's just gasoline. Rain gardens. This is just a natural area that has become a rain garden. By, by virtue of the fact that they've slowed down the flow of water in it and out of it, or out of it. So it's sitting there and percolating down. Now, if, if it's rock or the ground is really hard, it's not going to go down. You've got, uh, that's what the plants are for, is to give the water an, an avenue into the soil. Uh, if you all want to go to that thing, I'll, I'll be happy to meet you out there. Uh, if you want to go to the, the rain garden on Tuesdays or Fridays, and you want, want to give me a time that you intend to go there, I'll, I'll meet you out there. Um, and it, the stuff I can't answer, which is numerous about a rain garden, I'll introduce you to the people that can answer those questions. Um, there are a lot of very attractive rain garden designs. And uh, you can include a variety of plants to attract birds, butterflies, and other wildlife. And these, don't, these do drain. They, the, the water soaks down into the soil and it runs off slightly, just slowing it down. Grassy swales, that's any time you see grass or uh, ditch, ditches where it's wide and ditch lilies, any time there's uh, plant material that's, that's growing in there, which does the same thing as the rain garden stuff. Can be planted with plants that like added moisture, which is like your ditch lilies, like your regular day lilies. Um, uh, irises, no, don't do that. Forget I said that. Um, but there are some water irises that would do well. And um, trying to think of other plants, any ideas that do well in a, a semi-moist environment? Uh, rose mallow uh, or your hibiscuses, they like it wet. If you drive through Florida, you see you look on the sides of the road and you'll see in a marshy area that there's tons of uh, Rosa Sharon's. Can be planted with materials which like moisture, capture pollutants, and slow down the flow of the water, which allows it to percolate into the ground. Wildlife protection. Providing food, water, and shelter can increase the diversity of wildlife that you can enjoy in your backyard. And especially people in the city really love seeing critters in their yard. Uh, my 95-year-old my uncle loves seeing those squirrels and the deer and the, and the little rodent, the little, um, oh, the ones that tear out your foundation, um, groundhogs. He loves seeing those critters in his backyard. And he's 95. He doesn't care if they rip out his foundation. <laughs> 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 Chipmunks, you know, uh, people love that kind of stuff. So, me, not so much. <laughs> um, butterflies, dragonflies, and frogs all enjoy plants which feed and shelter them. <clears throat> Native plants which attract pollinators. This is a good, um, a good page to use when you go sh uh, shopping for plants. I've got some of these. Now the push right now is for as many native plants as you can squeeze into your yard, which is super. Um, I don't limit myself to native plants just because I like all plants. But there are people that will, uh, I think the rain gardens, they've really emphasized native plants out there. I have some native plant seeds that I'll bring you in the fall. It's getting a little hot to transplant stuff or a little late to, to uh, try to get seeds to generate. Protect the water's edge. Wider and more diverse the vegetation at the water's edge, the more beneficial it is to water quality. And here's your references to your Tennessee Smart Yards. Now, here's one more thing. This is how the Smart Yard book works. You get points for everything you do, according to them, that is good for your yard. You get, they, they have little check marks. 
and they have determine your family's landscape objective and you do that and you get two inches you get the, you get a reward of two inches the next thing assess yard site conditions two inches and your goal is to get to 36 inches if you get to 36 inches you get to submit your request for the Tennessee smart yard designation and <laughs> you can tell all your neighbors that that you have a smart yard so virtue signaling at its best but it's pretty good and that is it for me thank you for coming thank you